Good evening, friends of the Goleto Library. My name is Sandy Richter. I am the Robert H. Gundry Chair of Biblical Studies at Westmont College over in Montecito, and it is my pleasure to bring to you this evening our lecture, Digging Up the Bible, or What Can Archaeology Tell Us About the Bible? I myself have been involved with archaeology since 1992 when I took my first Syro-Palestinian archaeology course, and in 1994 when I went to excavate for the first time under the luminary uh, Lawrence Steger of Harvard University. I was a graduate student doing my PhD in Hebrew Bible at the Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations Department and excavating an ancient Philistine city was important to my training. Since that time, I've taken scores of students overseas to do the same. We've excavated at Tel Zeta, Tel Rehov, Tel Dan. And in each of these educational endeavors, I've had the same ambition to answer that question. What is it that archeology span can tell us about the Bible? And that's what we're up to this evening. Now, before we launch, uh, I'd like to say right off the bat that at every Christmas, Passover, Easter, we will be deluged with documentaries that announce uh, a never before seen evidence has demonstrated that Jesus never existed or never before uncovered data demonstrates that Jews were never in Egypt. Let me say that these global claims regarding what archaeology can do for the Bible are a bit unrealistic. And so as a biblical scholar and as someone who's spent more than one summer with dirt caked into every crevice of my body, I would like to explore with you that question. What exactly can archaeology do in the course of biblical studies. I am coming to you via Zoom, as is everyone else, so I am about to share my slides with you and see if we can get this show on the road. Alrighty, digging up the Bible. What can archeology span tell us about the Bible? So the first question, what archeology span can do? Archeology span first is able to recreate the milieu, get us past the great barrier and move us toward the real people and real places of the biblical text. This is archeology's span primary contribution to the study of the biblical text. Every once in a while, archaeology can also play the tool of the apologist, meaning the person who is in the process of defending the historicity of the text itself. So every once in a while, archaeology shows up and proves some biblical event or person historical and contradicts what is known in my discipline as the hermeneutic of suspicion. The hermeneutic of suspicion is that posture among the academy that the biblical text, the national history of Israel, is fictional until proven otherwise by means of external evidence. We'll get into this. All right, so recreating the milieu. This primary task of the biblical text can be illustrated in the four-room pillared house. You're looking at an image of a very cleaned up excavation site. There are three men, three excavators located in it to help give you perspective. And what you're looking at is the footprint of the standard architecture of the ancient Israelite. This would be the two bedroom cape of ancient Israel if you're from New England, or perhaps the Sears catalog bungalow if you're a native to Santa Barbara. This footprint helps to indicate that the people who came to be known as Israel are moving out of pastoral nomadism and have built their housing based on the footprint of a tent. It's called the Four Room Pillared House because, as you can see, there are pillars uh, embedded in the floor. Let me show you a diagram of the footprint. It offers you rooms one, two, and three, and a back room, room four, that is used primarily for storage. Each of those circular installations you see in the floor, colored in tan, those are indeed the foundations of pillars that were holding up the edifice. 
How big were these houses? Well, they're pretty small, but this reconstruction shows you that they are two-story. A lot of living would happen on the roof as well. In fact, if you know your Bible very well, you know that the prophet Elijah winds up on the roof of a building, and in Acts chapter 2, the disciples wind up on the roof of a building as well. The weather in Israel is much like Santa Barbara. There is a long uh, dry season, and roofs were real living space. The second floor is where the family did most of its living. And here, mats would be rolled out at night so that uh, folks could sleep, communal meals, uh, as people lounged on the floor and ate off essentially a blanket out of a communal bowl. Uh, the first floor, well, take a look at the first floor. And let me move to another reconstruction here, because in this reconstruction, you can see the first floor a little more clearly. Do you know what you're looking at? Yes, those would be critters, uh, large livestock critters that are living indoors on the first floor and eating out of stone mangers. But for those of you out there who celebrate Christmas, when you pull out your nativity scenes this December, uh, they are probably going to have little wooden mangers. And on top of that, the idea is going to be kind of like a Pennsylvania dairy barn down the street from the actual inn where Mary and Joseph were trying to find housing. Well, if Larry Steger is correct, and I think he probably is, that first century scene with Joseph and Mary and the not yet born Jesus took place on the first floor of a four room pillared house where they do indeed keep animals, not all their animals, but animals that are fragile for one reason or another, animals that have just given birth, are just about to give birth or being fattened up for um, some sort of coming holiday. One of the reasons we know they're animals on the first floor is because the cobbling. As you look at this diagram, you can see that underneath the donkey and the cow, there's actual cobblestone, which allows the animal's urine to pass through the stones and seep into the soil without becoming a muddy, disgusting mess. And those stone uh, eating troughs, I can show you dozens of those from Megiddo, where there were horse stables, uh, which were housing livestock as well. So although we in Santa Barbara are very attached to our pets, and some of you have dozens of them, uh, very few of you would think about bringing a cow or a donkey or a sheep or a goat into the house. But the Israelites did and part of it was protection. And another aspect of it is these animals actually provided central heat for the house as well. So this sort of reconstruction helps us to see the Israelites in real space and time. We get to see them as real people who lived real lives. And as we move into the New Testament, we get to see a story like Mary and Joseph uh, expanded via the actual milieu of their lives. And I can hear Joseph pounding on the door, speaking to the innkeeper saying, there's no room in this tiny little two-bit town and my wife is about to give birth. I've helped bring calves into the world. I've helped bring lambs into the world, but I've never helped bring a human into the world. Help me out. And I can hear the innkeeper saying, dude, I am so sorry. I have got nothing to offer you on the second floor. The roof is absolutely maxed out. Every inch of property I have has been filled up by this federally required uh, mandate of a census. But I, I, do, I do have a stall back in the back corner. It's empty. Uh, at least it's dry. It's warm. It's private. My wife will be nearby if things go wrong. Sorry, that, that's all I can offer. These sorts of images help us to get back into the real space and time of the ancient characters in the biblical text. Another interesting detail about this architectural feature, you're looking at a map right now, a map of Syria, Palestine, um, uh, ancient Israel, and right here highlighted on your slide is the central hill country of Israel. And lo and behold, whereas you would never find a four room pillared house in this central hill country at the beginning of the late Bronze Age, let's say about 1550 BC, by the time you move into the Iron One period, about 1200 BC, 
there are hundreds of these little four room pillared houses popping up all over the hill country. So just like in Santa Barbara, when you see tiled roofs and stucco walls, you see the influence of Spanish culture. And when you see the track houses out in Goleta, you see the influence of 1950s American culture. What you're seeing is that architecture helps us track people groups, and it helps us understand immigrations and recognize them. In 1200 BC, the people who we will come to know as Israel immigrate into the land, and they bring a, a unique architecture with them. All right, what about apologetics? What can archaeology do regarding actually demonstrating historicity for the biblical text? Well, there are two types of historical evidence that I deal with with my students all the time. I like to call one category internal and one category external. The internal evidence is, is what's recorded in the Bible itself, the national history of Israel, the collection of wisdom literature that you and I know as Proverbs and Job the gospel accounts, the epistles of the New Testament. This is internal evidence that is presented inside the biblical narrative itself. But of course, the biblical narrative has been collected, it's been culled, it's been edited, and it's been handed to us 21st century types as a complete literary unit. External evidence, in contrast, is evidence that comes from sources outside the biblical text. Evidence that comes from archaeology, that's the material culture that any society leaves behind, and epigraphy, which is the written evidence that any society leaves behind. And returning to that idea of the hermeneutic of suspicion, in my field, typically the internal evidence, that being the written biblical evidence, is questionable because it has been culled and uh, canonized and uh, edited for future generations, whereas the external evidence, uh, people have often a little more confidence in that. So what I'm after as a person who does biblical studies in archaeology is I'm looking for both. I'm looking for the opportunity to take the biblical literary evidence and the external evidence and see where they meet. And when those points connect, being able to say, okay, I have found this particular institution, this particular event, or this particular person that is represented in the biblical text. Now, there are problems with external evidence as regards the Bible, and the first one is that the biblical narrative happened a very long time ago. We are dealing with a period that reaches back to at least 2000 BC, if Abraham is an historical character. And we are also dealing with the fact that much of Israel's history is the history of a pre-centralized society. That means there's no state. And since there's no state, we're going to deal with the realities of a lack of evidence. Uh, let me explain it this way. When we are dealing with pre-centralized communities, we can expect there to be very little external evidence because it's the centralized state that builds the cities and the fortifications and the waterworks systems that we as archeologists typically find. It is centralized states that collect taxes and make it possible for monumental building which will endure the centuries of time to endure. It is centralized states that put up monuments to celebrate their kings and that record tax records and documents of sale and uh, victory monuments and building inscriptions, all of which is the bread and the butter of an archaeologist. So what type of external evidence is available to the historian? Well, monumental building, fortified cities, waterworks, palaces, temples, inscriptions, that would be epigraphic evidence, victory stela, building de uh, dedications, votive monuments, that's when you dedicate something to a deity and you put your name on it. All of these pieces of evidence, as I have rehearsed, are largely dependent on the existence of a centralized government. So when we're dealing with the story of Israel prior to the United Monarchy, we are dealing with a society 
that has no centralized government. They have no state. They have no tax base. They have no kings or capital cities, palaces or temples to decorate or to dedicate. There is no standing army, no kings to honor by means of victory steal, a few fortified towns, no national treasury, no royal patronage to finance the writings of a national history or the preservation of texts recounting the acts of kings that they did not yet have. And there's no reason for anyone else to be interested in speaking about this decentralized state. So all this to say that when we're approaching the biblical text prior to the United Monarchy, we should expect to have trouble with the issue of external evidence. You're looking at a timeline that one of my publishers has created for me to facilitate uh, teaching laity. And I have circled on this slide where the United Monarchy is. This is the account of the Bible regarding its own history. So it starts in Eden with Adam and Eve. I have question marks because uh, we can't date these events, uh, not through the lens of a uh, regular historiographic method. Noah, same issue. But Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we start set stepping in to datable times. And this is called the Middle Bronze Age, if we're reading these texts correctly. Down into Egypt, as you follow, circling back the desert wanderings, the conquest, the era of the judges, and now you hit the United Monarchy. This is the point in time when we can start expecting to be bumping into monumental structures or armies or victory stealing. So as I teach my students, any era of the biblical text that recounts a narrative under the shadow that I've just put on your screen is going to be an era that is, is historically problematic. And that shouldn't surprise us. Okay, so with the divided monarchy and beyond, we really have very little uh, trouble with issues of historicity. There is a plethora of external evidence of Israel's existence from the divided monarchy on. Now, we certainly cannot qualify every detail of the biblical text, but we've got at least a dozen of her kings named in inscriptions and monuments. We've got stamp seals. We've got contracts. Uh, We've got data. Uh, so there remains only a small but very vocal minority of biblical scholars who dare to suggest that Israel did not exist after 932, 922 BC, which is when the divided monarchy launches. Now, whether or not Israel existed differently than the internal narrative recounts is, is another set of, of questions. But the fact that she existed, this really isn't up for debate, not among uh, the historical and archaeological crowd. But again, prior to the divided monarchy has been quite problematic. It is because of this that the discovery of the Dan Stela in 1993, July 21st, 1993, proved to be such an exciting moment. Uh, it was, again, the summer of 1993. A lot of us remember the summer of 1993. I certainly do. I was teaching Hebrew at a seminary on the East Coast, and I woke up that morning to hear on NPR the name of King David being repeated over and over again. And in my sleepy graduate student stupor, I was saying, what? Who? Why is David on NPR? And the answer is that up in the city of Dan, you can see it on this map of the divided monarchy that's on the slide in front of you. Dan is the furthest most northern town of ancient Israel. In that city, in modern excavations, um, excuse me, in that city, which the Via Maris, the major highway of the ancient world, runs right through it, in that city, which is a the primary source of the Jordan River, in that city that stands on the border between Israel and Aram Damascus, a victory stela had been discovered. Um, when I talk about water, by the way, in Israel, you should anticipate that water, rushing cold, fresh water, is as rare in Israel as it is in Santa Barbara. And so showing you a few images of the rushing waters that form the Jordan River is something I can't resist. Uh, you're looking right now at the excavations of Tel Dan, and you see evergreen oaks scattered all over this territory, just like you would in the hill country 
of Santa Barbara. This is Avraham Biran, uh, the direct, director of Tel Dan. He's been excavating, well, he had been excavating at this site since 1966. It was the longest running dig in all of Israel until uh, director Biran passed away, um, not all that long ago. All right, in his entire 30-year career in this site, Biran had never found anything of the significance that came through that morning on July 21st. What you're looking at here is, I'm sure, an overly detailed uh, diagram of the map of the gate structure of Tel Dan. Uh, the news is that gates are often augmented and expanded in order to protect a city. So in this particular gate structure, you have the upper gate, the paved walkway, the inner gate, another outer gate, and an entrance into the gated city. At the bottom of the slide, look at the red oval, because it is in that red oval that this particular discovery was found. So the entire gate complex had been excavated, and on this July day, Biran's staff caught glinting in the sun a piece of monumental epigraphy, uh, an event of events. Uh, this is an image of that outer court, all cleaned up and ready to go. Uh, you see the entrance to the gated city, to your left, you see an arrow that is unidentified. That arrow is where the Dan Stila was discovered in 1993. These are some of my past students uh, walking up through this courtyard. Here is one student who decided she was going to be a deity for the day in uh, entryway number two. And here's my excavation team back in 2006 as we're working with this site as well. Okay, what did they find? Well, they found in secondary use, that means it had once been a victory stela, it had been knocked down and chopped to pieces, but the stone was valuable. So in secondary use, they found a chunk of stone in a wall beneath a particular destruction, Tiglath Pileser III, 733 BC, which indicates that the stone must be older than 733. BC, you see the meter stick highlighted there, and jutting out of the foundation of this wall is this very smoothed off uh, piece of granite. And as it was pulled out, you see that the victory stela uh, that they had found uh, was actually commemorating the victory of an Aramean king over Israel and Judah. In other words, it was a foreign army celebrating the fact that they had just defeated Judah. As you look at that script, that is classic pre-exilic script, very readable, obviously coming from a professional. Now we want to know, what does it say? Yeah, and here it is all cleaned up and ready to go. And as you look right here, if your pre-exilic Hebrew script is strong, what you're reading is Beit David, clear as a crystal, Beit David. And for all you Jewish listeners who got through Hebrew school, you're recognizing those words. The Beit David communicates the house of David. Hmm. So not just the structure of his home, but in the ancient world, a Beit is a dynasty. And so what this Aramean king is bragging about in his victory steal is he has just defeated the dynasty of David. Can I tell you that prior to July 21st, 1993, David was considered as historical as Arthur of Camelot. But after this discovery, David became a real historical character. Because right here, and this is the drawing of this particular inscription, our Aramean king, who was no friend to Israel, is bragging about the fact that he has taken out David's dynasty. And the date of this particular inscription, about 850 BC. That puts the writer of this inscription closer to David than you and I are to Abraham Lincoln. Now, can we derive from this a, a bunch of details about David's life? No, but we certainly can derive from this that he existed, that he was recognized as a king of a dynasty, so much so that a foreign king would brag about defeating him. All right, so that is a very fun moment when archaeology served the tool 
of the apologist. Let's look at a few more things. Uh, the high place at Dan is also just a really interesting discovery. Um, in 1 Kings 12, chapter 25, we read about the first king of the divided monarchy in the north. His name is Jeroboam. So uh, Israel has split in half north-south because they have a bunch of differences. I know that Americans can't even fathom a northern and southern division in a country, but Jeroboam is this first king. And he is approved of God, and he's supposed to take the northern half of the country. Jeroboam is going to wind up not approved by the God of Israel because he's not actually comfortable with keeping Israel's worship as it has been. So here it goes. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim. This is up north, and he lived there. And he went out from there, and he built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will return to the house of David if this people continue to go and offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. In other words, the temple uh, that has been dedicated and built in Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me, and they will return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king consulted, and he made two golden calves, and he said to them, to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem, Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one of these cult representations, these deity representations at Bethel, and the other he put at Dan. Dan and Bethel are the northern and southern borders of uh, Jeroboam's territory. It's not at all unusual for a king to want to mark his borders. Notice as well the text. Um, behold, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. Uh, if you know the story of Aaron at the foot of Mount Sinai, you know that that story didn't go very well when Aaron pulls a golden calf out of the fire. And uh, God is extremely angry with Aaron and Moses comes down and smashes the tablets. And for uh, one brief shining moment, we're not even sure the Israelites are going to make it. So your historian, your biblical narrator, is associating what Jeroboam does with what Aaron did at the foot of Mount Sinai. So we are in no way confused about our historian's opinion of what's happening in Dan. This is um, betrayal. This is treason. This is idol worship. Well, uh, lo and behold, uh, very early on, we were able to excavate the high place at Dan complete with iron shovels and various um, appurtenances and equipment that go with a functioning religious site. You are looking at the excavation right here with that lovely evergreen oak trying to survive in the midst. Here you find the ancient staircase up to the high place, the Bama. In Hebrew, this high place, uh, you can see it from another angle here, uh, would have been uh, where the animal sacrifice would have been offered up to the gods, whereas the National Park Society has actually put a pretend altar in front of the steps to help you envision it. I actually think that altar is way too big for this particular uh, cult site, but nobody asked me. Okay, what would the Bama have looked like? It would have looked like this, and the priest would have taken the sacrifice up high and offered it to the deity. Um, this is what's going on in the Northern Kingdom. And this is why Jeroboam ultimately winds up losing his place. And here is a close up of that platform, the Bama at Dan. So, this not only helps us with the milieu of ancient Israelite practice, it also helps us with the historical conversation. Yeah. This high place actually existed and it functioned, and we can demonstrate that. By the way, as you look past that platform, you're looking into the hills of Lebanon. And the year that I was there with my team was 2006. And for those of you who are really into public events, that was the year that Israel decided to invade Lebanon. And whereas Dan is now a national park, that means that Israel was firing missiles over my team's head and Lebanon was firing missiles over my team's head. Um, archaeology can be a dangerous occupation. Okay, so after the United Monarchy, looking at the divided monarchy, we don't really have um, as many issues with historical questions. But before, as you're remembering under the shadow, we have a lot 
of issues. Okay, so let me close this down by a very fun little study uh, regarding uh, Israel's classic uh, appellative that it is a land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, my last few excavations have been with at Tel Rehov. Uh, Tel Rehov is um, led by the inimitable um, Amahai Mazar. You are looking at the tell right here, the lower tell, and there is an upper tell beyond it. Uh, we worked primarily in the lower tell. This is a major city on the map. You can see that it uh, is situated right at the join of the Jordan and the Jezreel Valleys. Very important travel site, so much so that the highways are going to pass right by our city. As a result, what we found in our city was a very mixed populace. The array of fertile fields surrounding the city, the fact that it is on a major thoroughfare, means that my team found evidence of Egyptian culture, Canaanite culture, and Israelite culture. And uh, the era that we were digging in was the emergence of Israel in the land and during the monarchy as well. All right, so again, the excavation is directed by legendary archaeologist Amahai Mazar of Hebrew University. I have to brag for just a moment and say that my students, my group of 20 students, uh, was the reason that Ami decided to uh, defer his retirement one more year because he knew that my students were so good that he would be able to get more done in that season than he could have ever imagined. All right, well, one of Ami's claim to fame is finally explaining that statement, a land flowing with milk and honey. Um, many have wandered, wondered over the millennia what exactly that phrase means. In the words of Jerry Gord of Veggie Tales, if you have preschoolers in your house, um, it sounds sticky. Yeah, milk and honey. What does this mean? Well, milk actually isn't hard. Our heroes were pastoralists, and as pastoralists, they kept goats, they kept sheep, and they took in a lot of milk every day. They turned it into cheese and into yogurt. It was an important part of their food source, but honey has been hard. Is this just a reference to how uh, the wildflowers of land and, and that there are a lot of bees there? Is it the sweet syrup that emerges from grinding up the pulp of grapes and dates and figs and carobs like it can be today? Well, a lot of folks just concluded that because they didn't know what else to do with a reference to honey. Even though that doesn't seem to be what the Bible is actually saying. Rather, it seems like it's speaking of bee honey. But as there wasn't a lot of evidence for any particular concentration of bees or honey in the Levant, this textual implication coming out of the Bible just kind of got ignored because we didn't know what to do with it. Well, take a look at your slide. Uh, this uh, reality that we didn't know what to do with the honey reference existed until 2006. And in 2006, Ami superintended the discovery of an industrial sized apiary at Tel Rehov. Apiary means um, a bee facility. Uh, industrial sized in area C in the Iron Two Age, that means the divided monarchy. Now, although the hives shown here um, might not look like much to you because they are just mud in the midst of more mud, um, and the average excavator possibly could have just plunged through all of this data with an, an ill-fated pickaxe, Ami is not your average excavator. And what he recognized here is an industry that is still indigenous in the land of Palestine today. This particular apiary was located right in the heart of the city. Uh, as you look at this diagram, you can see it reconstructed. Right in the heart of the city, where it apparently operated for decades. It was finally destroyed in the early ninth century, probably a Shishak of Egypt's invasion. There were as many as 200 hives, housing more than 200 bees. No, I'm sorry, two million bees, producing as much as a half a ton of honey per year, as well as a lot of beeswax, which was used to make molds for casting weapons, statues, and other 
metal objects. This is phenomenal. And one of the things I found so fun about this is this apiary is right downtown. So those bees are flying in and out every day to make their honey and do their work. This reconstruction shows workers who were garbed to protect themselves from the bees opening up the lids of, the, of these um, clay large jars in order to reach inside and get the honey. We also know that they were using smoke to keep them quiet. All right, what about the bees themselves? Well, here you see an image of this same industry in ancient Egypt, which, by the way, um, it often controlled Tilrahov. And very interesting is that an analysis of the charred honeycomb at Rahov and current scientific ability revealed the remains of Rahov's bees. You see right here a microscopic image of a drone bee head which surprisingly um, were not the standard nasty bees found in Israel today, known for their aggression and their tendency to swarm. But rather, this particular bee that the excavators were able to find microscopically within the remains of the honey in this apiary are actually a variety that hails from the cool mountainous regions of Anatolia. That's modern Turkey. And these Anatolian bees not only um, have a cooler temperament, they also have a much higher honey yield, three to eight times higher than Israel's native bees. So here you have it, one window into the role of archeology span in biblical studies, specifically via our site at Tel Rehoth by which we learn that a land flowing with milk and honey was a land which apparently was flowing with milk and honey. The honey of an indigenous industry that probably existed throughout Israel's experience. So digging up the Bible or what archeology span can tell us about the Bible, there you have it. I'm Sandy Richter, I'm from Westmont College, and it has been an honor to be with you this evening.